All right, our lesson tonight is Satan's deadliest weapon. Satan's deadliest weapon. Satan uses all manner of devices to draw us into sin and disbelief. I mean, Harold was leading a couple of songs there that dealt with temptation and the problems that that causes. The idea is, is, is if Satan can you know, reduce our belief, getting us to sin is a lot is a lot easier for him. Some of his tactics you probably recognize. Troubles or sorrows to rob us of our joy. Illness and trials to bring us to the point where we doubt God's goodness or even His presence in our lives. False ideas and doctrines to capture our attention. And of course, the lure of immorality, worldly pleasure, and power to seduce us into serving Him rather than serving the Lord. And I, I mean, that's a short list. There's a much longer list, but you get, you get the idea. Now, all of these are mighty entrapments that make many people fall into sin, fall away from the faith. But all of these together do not wreak as much damage to our souls or to the church as his deadliest of weapons, which is words. Words are his deadliest of weapons. We've all heard the quotation, you know, the pen is mightier than the sword. We've all seen and experienced certain words that have seared into our conscience and memories over time. Words that, that move entire nations for good. When John F. Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, but rather what you can do for your country, a call to sacrifice, a call to commitment. Uh, you know, people remember those words and were moved by those words at the time and even today. Other words, other words plunge us into war. Heil Hitler! Would you like to go somewhere or be part of a meeting where everyone were, was saying, Heil Hitler, I'd be a little nervous. Words that can produce a powerful and visceral effect even to this day. The, the shooter, the recent shooter uh, that killed all those people, a Nazi a sympathizer. And so when it comes to attacking, distracting, dividing the disciples of Jesus Christ Satan's deadliest tools are words. So in my lesson this evening, I'd like to describe some situations where words either build or destroy the Lord's church. I mentioned in my class this morning that more problems happen in the church because of words. Now in the church, the determining factor that separates a growing church from a divided church, a happy congregation from a war zone, a loving Christian family from a closed and cold one. The difference between these extremes are usually the words that we speak. Words that we either speak to ourselves or to one another or about one another or words that are spoken to the outside community. The words that we use can build or they can destroy. We choose, and many times Satan urges us to choose what is not true, pushes us to say what is ugly, what is hurtful, what is mean, what is proud. Now the Bible has a lot of examples of such destructive words. For example, when Job was struck down with many afflictions and needed a word of faith, he needed a word of, of hope or love, Satan moved his wife to deliver a deadly blow with words. She answered his pain with the words, why don't you curse God and die? Pretty good bedside manner, wouldn't you say? She didn't completely destroy his faith, but her words plunged him into a silent depression and suffering that only added to his misery. How about when Moses sent the spies into the promised land to prepare for the entry of the Jews into their new homes? Not all were positive. Of the 12 who went in, 10 came back with a report filled with fear, 
words of doubt about the possible success of their mission. And despite the appeal of the two spies, two other spies, Caleb and Joshua, the people were swayed by the negative words of the cowardly spies. I want you to note also that the spies who were against going in were in the majority, but they were wrong. You know, this is the problem of leadership by survey or polls. The majority are not always accurate or right. Mere words that these spies spoke. But because of these words, the Israelites were punished by God to wandering in the desert for an additional 40 long years. Why? Words. Their words cost the nation an entire generation who would ultimately die in the desert and never see the promised land because of words spoken. Another example of destructive words appears in the episode where Jesus is gathered with the apostles and a woman came to anoint him with expensive perfume. In both Matthew 26 and in John chapter 12, the writers quote Judas as saying that this was a waste of money. It could have been used differently. Now, both writers note that Judas was speaking out of greed and not really a concern for the poor. Matthew, however, describes the reaction not of Judas, but of the other disciples at Judas' words. They were indignant, they were upset, they were stirred up, if you wish. His evil comment, born of greed and selfishness, worked to destroy the unity and the spirituality of the entire group. James, the author of the epistle and leader of the early church in Jerusalem, tells us that words, words are like fire. They can consume and destroy great tracts of land. Actually, he refers to the tongue as a fire in James chapter 3, verse 4. But the tongue produces words. The wrong words planted in the right place at the right time can destroy our lives and the lives of so many other people. Now, of course, the opposite of this is true as well. The right words spoken at the right time and at the right place can be lifesavers. Solomon expresses this idea in Proverbs 25, 11. He says, like apples of gold and settings of silver is a word spoken in the right circumstances. For example, David turned the tide of battle against the, Philistine, uh, the, against the Philistines and their champion Goliath when he said the following to the giant enemy in 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning in verse 45. He's facing Goliath and he said, he said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands and I will strike you down and remove your head from you and I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all of this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear for the battle is the Lord's and He will give you into our hands. Talk about words of encouragement. Galvanized his forces. Nehemiah, another example, empowered the people when he went before them and said, come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. Nehemiah chapter two, verse 17. In context, he was really saying, we can do this. Even the man we call Doubting Thomas was also one of the apostles who provided motivation for his fellow disciples with the words that he spoke. When their lives were threatened and Jesus' enemies were closing in, he encouraged the others to continue following the Lord even into a dangerous situation when he said, let us also go that we may die with him. John eleven sixteen. 16. And then of course, there are the many words of Jesus Himself, so encouraging, so loving, so life-affirming, like what He said to the woman who was caught in adultery. Woman, He said, where are they? Did no one condemn you? 
And she said, no one, Lord. And he said, neither do I condemn you. You know what? Those are the words I want to hear. When I come before Jesus, yeah, I want to hear, you know, good and faithful servant, but I want to hear, neither do I condemn you. How encouraging. Go your way, he said, from now on, sin no more. John 8, 10 and 11. So many words to speak and are spoken, but only certain words spoken at a certain moment can build up, can infuse hope into a tired soul, can strengthen one's resolve to carry on, to aim higher, to do one's best. All these things, words. If we let him, Satan will always provoke us to use words that destroy, words that tear down, words that only build ourselves up, words that dishonor Christ in some way. You know, I said at the beginning of my lesson that what will, you, what will determine the future of our congregation will not be you know, how many visitors we get, although we're always happy to have visitors, or how much money we give, or what kind of programs, or how many preachers we have, those are all good things. But the single most important factor affecting our congregation today and every day until Jesus comes will be our words. The words we use and the way we use them. So this being said, I'd like to leave you with three reminders to guide us in our use of words. Reminder number one, you always have a choice. Unless you are seriously handicapped or challenged, you have control over the words you speak. In the end, you're the one who chooses to build or you choose to destroy. You're the one who chooses to support or to let fall. You're the one that's ready to tell the truth or lie. You control this, I control this. Words make the difference between success and failure. Words make the difference between peace or division, between acceptance and rejection. By your words, you personally will contribute to what we become. So I encourage you, be aware of this and choose carefully what you say in every situation. Don't let Satan choose your words for you. You know, one of the exercises that I do to check myself when I'm talking, when I'm having that self-talk in my mind, and I'm you know, talking to myself about you know, what happened. You have a situation that happens, usually something you don't like or something that's difficult and you're, you're talking, you, know, you, got the, you got the playlist going on in your mind, you're turning it over, or you're talking to somebody else or this and that. I ask myself, who is speaking here? Who is speaking? Who is speaking to me? How am I speaking? Is, is this Jesus speaking to me? Or is this Satan speaking to me? And you know what, when you ask yourself that question, it's pretty easy to determine which one is doing the talking inside your head. Which one is you know, pushing the words out of your mouth. Reminder number two, you will be judged by your words. Jesus was very clear on this point. He says, and I say to you that every careless word that men shall speak, they shall render account for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. Matthew 12, 36 and 37. Since words are so powerful, God holds us accountable for every one we speak. That's a scary idea. What your mother taught you, or should have taught you, is very true and very biblical. If you don't have something good to say about people, about the church, about the program, about whatever, then just don't say anything. Now, you're allowed to feel badly, you're allowed to have a negative opinion about someone or something, but unless you've talked to God first, or you're talking to the right person to resolve things, you risk your own condemnation by speaking out. Again, I have another this little rule of thumb that helps remind me when I'm becoming too critical, and trust me, it's easy for me to be critical. 
The rule of thumb is share the good, pray about the bad. If all I see is, is bad in you, then I need to pray about that, not talk about that. If I see good in you, then I need to remind you of the good that I see in you. And when I talk to somebody else about you, I need to just talk about the good things I see in you. The bad things I see in you, I need to bring those to the Lord in prayer. If you want to grow personally in Christ, if you want to avoid condemnation and build up the church, judge yourself and your speech before you share it with other people. I was mentioning that again this morning in our Ephesians class. We were talking about words and so on and so forth. And I was saying, you know, I guess I'm not of the, the generation that uses Facebook a lot. That's the big thing nowadays, Facebook, everybody's on Facebook. And I can see the, the usefulness of, of Facebook, certainly. Uh, our Bible talk, uh, television ministry, uh, we're on Facebook. We get lots of followers on Facebook that, that you know, dial up our, 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 our videos and stuff like that. But I also sometimes see things, not, not, I'm not on Facebook, but I see things on my wife's computer or others when they talk about it, I say, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You are a Christian man or you are a Christian woman and you have posted this picture of yourself so that everybody can see you? You're giving all the details of the quote party you went to and, and this is for everyone to see? Shame on you. You, want, you, you need a filter. Some of the people in this church need a filter. I won't call out names, but you know who you are. And some of you are not here. <laughs> I hope you're watching the video on Facebook. That'd be strange, hey, getting called out on Facebook for what you put on Facebook. Yeah, I said that a, a, a good way to kind of you know, filter your stuff if you can't put it on the screen back here on Sunday morning so everybody can enjoy it, don't put it on Facebook. If you'd be ashamed if somebody showed your stuff that you post publicly in the church building, then you better not post it at all. That'd be a pretty good filter for everybody. Amen? Amen. I, I think so. I'm not being overly harsh here. I mean, we have a reputation to maintain. We're Christians. If people see our lives, you know, we've got this wonderful opportunity to share our lives and share things in a public way because of the technology today. It means we have an opportunity to show the best we have about living in Christ. But if people can't tell the difference between, if people are saying, you're a Christian? Wait a minute, I've been on your Facebook for a month. You're telling me you're a Christian? If that's the reaction you're getting, well maybe, maybe you need to think twice about what you're doing. And then reminder number three, strive to fill the world with His words, not your words. His words, not your words. You know, if the whole world would be quiet just for 10 minutes and listen only to Jesus' words, this would be a much better place to live in. As it is, we have to compete with so many other words in order to get the message of the gospel out. There are the words of Satan spread through lies and alluring offers of pleasure. There are the words of this world, anxious to keep us occupied with the riches and the cares of earthly pursuit. And then there are the words of life spoken by Jesus and recorded by His apostles in His book, the Bible. And we have to decide which words will we fill our hearts and minds with? Which words will we fill our homes and families with? Which words will we fill the world with? Which ones? People have a finite capacity to take in information. You ever go to a, you know, when you were in school or taking courses or going to seminars, usually seminars, you know, because they're like five days long, three days long, and you know, you get to that point, you know, you're taking it in, you're taking notes, I get it, whoa, how, I can't wait to get back, I'm going to use this, I'm going to try that, and then all of a sudden, by, you know, by the ninth lecture, blah, 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 you know, and they're, and they're still talking, but you know, it's just overflow, right? It's just, it's just flown out of your brain. You can't take in anymore. We have a finite capacity to take in 
information. There are just so many hours in one day and just so many words a person will be able to hear in any one day, in any one lifetime. And so the job that Jesus left us is to make sure that everybody in the world hears His word at least one time. For the first time in history, it is possible to communicate the words of Christ to every single in the world and to do it in one generation. We're, we're, we're that generation. I tell people, you know what, we're at bat. This is our at bats. You know the great preachers and ministers and missionaries of the past, Beryl, Barrett, Baxter, and all these guys, you know, who, who, who were prominent back in the 20s and 30s and 40s, you know, marvelous work, tremendously powerful missionaries who did all kinds of work. Well, they're dead now, they're gone. We're at bat. What will they say about our generation, this generation of the restoration movement, this generation, the church of Christ that existed now, how did we do? We can't rest on their laurels. And we're not responsible for what's going to happen in 2090. This is our at bats. This is our turn to fill the world with the words of Christ. And God has given us tools that no one ever had to do that very job. Are we doing it? Because of TV and radio, of course, print, especially the internet, we now have the technology to carry out Jesus' command in Matthew 28 and Mark 16 to the whole world. His word is in our hearts and on our lips, and He has provided the means to deliver it through modern communication technology. All that is left is to find those people in this generation who are ready to say, here I am, Lord, send me to turn the world upside down for Christ. It's our turn. What are we doing about it? Oh, what God could do with us, brothers and sisters, if we would go all out to fill the world with the words of Christ and not the words of Satan. As it is, we continue to squabble with words that hinder the church and hurt one another. We fill our minds with the prattle of fools who deny Christ for the love of the world. We know all the recent movie stars, what they're doing and so on and so forth, but we can't remember a single passage of scripture. What's wrong with that picture? We take our children to five different activities a week, you know, trampoline, taekwondo, whatever, you know, baseball, t-ball, swimming, gymnastics. You know, we wait for them for hours. Is that bad? No. But well, we don't bring them to Wednesday night Bible class, and we don't bring them to Sunday morning Bible class, and we've got no time for VBS. And yet when you ask parents, what do you want for your child? They say, well, I want my child to be happy. Well, I'm telling you, your child will not be happy if he doesn't know Christ. Amen. He, may, he, may, you know, he may go to the Olympics. Great. Anybody here remember who won the judo gold medal in 1984? Yeah. Better you have your child's name written in the book of life than on some medal. So you may be wondering, you know, what's, what's he asking us to do? I mean, this is Sunday night, it's supposed to be easy, laid back, you know, relax time. I wonder if Jesus will come on a Sunday evening. Boy, a lot of surprised people, huh? Here's what I want. I want us to watch our tongues. Most of the problems in this congregation stem from tongues. Bring your negatives to God in prayer. Save your positives for your brethren and work out your problems with each other face to face. That's what I want. Number two, I want us to use our tongues to fill the world with the word of Christ. I want us to take every opportunity to fill the world with the words of Christ. Not what we had for breakfast, not that we're getting a haircut, we can begin by filling our own minds and hearts by reaching 
or reading rather His word regularly. We can continue the process by using every means and tool we have to get the gospel out to everybody. You know, right here in little old Choctaw America, we've got a TV studio, we produce Bible technology, DVDs, CDs, and already are going all over the world. A teaching website that has access to every country in the world. A church website where Marty's sermons and my lessons are accessible to anyone. I want us to support that idea. Learn you know, the, the, where to send people to our website. ChoctawSaints.org, BibleTalk.tv. Hey, you ought to check this out. Hey, you got a Facebook? Link us to your friends. You can't teach your friends? Fine, link us, we'll teach them. And number three, I want us to obey the words of Jesus as soon as we can. Is Dylan, is it Dylan? Where is he? I haven't got my glasses on. Dylan, are you here? Stand up a minute. This is our newest brother in Christ right here. He was baptized this afternoon. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. Way to go, Dylan. Whether they are, whatever they are rather, I want to see people with zeal and a hunger and an impatience to obey His word. He said to his dad, I'm, I'm ready to be baptized, I'm, I'm dealing with life, I understand the gospel, I want to go to heaven, I know that in my own life there's sin. And he said to his dad, when's the right time? Should we go you know, after services tomorrow? When's the right time when we should go? And his dad wisely said, well now is the right time. Now is the right time. They just piled everybody into the car and they did it now. I want us to have that kind of zeal to do God's will. If He says repent and be baptized, I want to see a rush to be immersed. If He says don't do that, I want to see people stopping as quickly as they can. If he says serve, I want to see people competing with each other to do his work. If he says go or come, I want to see people saying, well where do you want me to go and when do you want me to leave? I want to see a glorious church of Christ, a light on a hill, a beautiful bride, a body strong, able to do the will of the Lord. Maybe I'm just a little tired of this earth and I'm hungry for a glimpse of heaven and a church hungry and thirsty for Christ, this is the best view that I can get of heaven while I am here on earth. I guess what I'm saying is I don't want the church, I don't want this church to be like the world. I want it to be the kingdom of God that when I am here, I see people of the kingdom, not people of the world. We got plenty of those. And so I hope that my words have been edifying for you. And if there's a step to take, if there's a decision to make, if there's a resolution to establish, a sin to leave behind, a savior to come to, I hope that you will do it now or come forward whichever is appropriate for you as we stand and as we sing our song of invitation this night.